discover. Each believer must take the time to discover his or her charisms. What charisms do I have? What charisms do you have? Have you discovered your charisms? And we can only discover our charisms through, first of all, prayers and discernment. Discerning the spirit. Why knowledge matters. Now joining me, Father Constant Leke. Father Constant Leke has just and will be just publishing his book, 900 pages, called Charism in the Church, Pauline Orientation and Actual Dynamics. It will be released on January 15, 2024 by Echter for log. Welcome Father Constant Leke. It's such a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much, Miss Sayin. So let's start with you. Who is Constant Father Constant Leke in one sentence? Father Constant Leke is a Catholic priest of the Diocese of Manfi in Cameroon, Africa, um, also a researcher, a scholar, a biblical scholar, and a writer. Wonderful. Now, what made you write the book and especially researching on charism in the first place? You know, uh, charisma is such something that is somehow intangible. We always tell, well, this person really has charisma, but we cannot really pin it down what really makes this person charismatic. So that's really fascinating. So what made you really interested in, in charisma in general? And yeah, of course, I... let's divine first and foremost at, at charisma. The major reason why I decided to write on charisms in the church is because I joined the charismatic renewal, the Catholic charismatic renewal, when I was still in secondary school. Very early on in my life, I joined the Catholic charismatic renewal, and there I saw the manifestations of the charisms, which are the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I saw people speaking in tongues, people prophesying, people interpreting tongues, and I wanted to, uh, to understand this reality deeply. That was the first reason. The second reason was that um, the charisms have become a, a hot um, debate topic in the contemporary church, in not only in Africa, but also in the world. Again, the topic of charism is a subject of uh, ecumenical debate and dialogues in the different Christian confessions and denominations. In the Catholic Church, Orthodox Church, Pentecostal churches, where the charisms are at the center of the spirituality of charismatic and Pentecostal churches. And the last reason why I delved into this um, topic is that it is a, a controversial topic. A lot of people um, mis have misconceptions about charisms. And so many have different notions about it. That is why I decided to make a systematic research on charisms in the church. That is wonderful. There are so many reasons to that. And uh, so let's start with... Define for us charism in general, and then we will go a little bit more specifically into the Pauline letters, because that's really what you're focusing on, your research on charism in the Pauline letters. The word charism comes from the Greek word charisma, which means the grace on merited favor of God. This grace 
has to do with gifts given by God freely to the believer to be used in the church for the upbuilding of others, other Christians, upbuilding of the church in general from the etymological um, definition of the word charisma. That will be the meaning of charisms. Gifts, God's gifts, God's grace, which is received freely unmerited for the upbuilding of the church. So why did you ultimately decide to study charism based on the Pauline letters? And why did you decide specifically on them? What really made you study charism, you know, through the Pauline I letters? Decided and to... first, of course, also explain to us the Pauline letters in general for, for us. The, the decision to study, to study charisms in the Pauline letters is because Paul, the Apostle Paul, was the first person to use the word charisma. It is in his letters that we see him using the word charisma in several places. First of all, in the first letter of the Corinthians, in the letter to the Ephesians and the letter to the Romans, Paul, the Apostle Paul, uses the word charisma. So it is he who is the originator of that word. We do not find that word in any other letter, in any other book of the Bible, of the scripture. That is why I decided to search for the word charisma or charisms in the letters of St. Paul and to be able to treat it according to his understanding. What does Apostle Paul understand by charisma? And how is it related to the gifts and grace of God in the life of the believer? Therefore, I couldn't study the words or the charisms in the letter of St. John or the letter of St. Peter or the letter of, um, um, or the book, the, the letter of um, um, the the other apostles, because they do not use the word um, charisma. It is Paul who originates the use of that word. And let's dive a little bit into what did you find specifically to the Pauline letters? In the Pauline letters, I found specifically that Paul talks so much about the theology of grace, which is not found in other letters, in other books of the New Testament. Paul heavily talks about grace, the free gift of God, that we are saved by God's grace, without any merit of us, without any work of us, we are, fed by, we are saved by faith, and uh, through grace. And that is why this theology of grace in the letters of St. Paul um, influences his thought on all the other aspects of his theology. That is what I discover. That is um, grace, the theology of grace is at the center of the Pauline theology. Now, dive, let's dive a little bit more into charism in general. So this is interesting because you did this research. And so how comes that some people have or display more charism than others in life? What do you think might be and, the reason? Yeah, from the, from the study of charisms in the Pauline letters, um, it is clear that every believer, every Christian has at least a charism. These charisms are the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian has at least one. At the same time, there are some Christians who have more than others. 
this will not depend on the merit of the individual, but it will all depend on the free gift of God. So God alone knows why he gifts some Christians more gifts, more charisms than others. These gifts, these charisms given are given for the good of others. It is not to benefit the individuals. It is given so that we can use them for the upbuilding of the church. This church is the body of Christ. And therefore, the source, who is God, he alone decides who to give and how many gifts or graces to give um, the individual. So we cannot have any concrete reason or concrete um, um, answer to why some Christians manifest more gifts, more um, graces, more charisms than others. So then according to you, you can't really improve your charism. According to Apostle Paul, St. Paul, the Christian is supposed to discover his charism and be able to improve on this charism through practice. It is through the use, usage, the constant usage of his charism that he can improve on his charisms. So there is always room for improvement. Because the moment the individual does not put into use his charism, that charism can even grow dead, can go dead, whereas the other who constantly put his charism into practice will improve upon the use and efficiency of his charisms. So would you say that, for example, I give you an example, to some people, let's say they are just naturally very happy, they're very uplifting, they have a lot of, they display a lot of joy, they do a lot of, in the sense of, uh, you know, how they interact with other people, they have a lot of energy, they, do you think like this might be a part of, 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 Uh, charism and how does this play out in social interactions so do you think that someone who displays a lot of charism is actually also somehow guided by let's say the holy spirit or the grace of god that there is a certain frequency or that this person emanates a certain energy that truly is connected to the divine Obviously, obviously the individual who manifests charisms um, obviously shows that um, the individual is connected to the divine because, as I've said, the source of every charism is, first of all, Trinitarian, is God. And um, these charisms are not um, something which come maybe from the sky. Of, at times, they, are, they, they, they begin from nature. Because grace, which is charism, is not opposed to nature. The two are complementary, which means someone who is born with a particular grace or gift and who is connected to God, that particular gift can be developed, becomes ingrained in the divine. So there is no opposition between the natural giftedness of the individual and the spiritual gifting or the charisms of the individual, the two are complementary. Therefore, if somebody is naturally happy, then the charisms will come to uplift it on the spiritual level. If someone has a natural gift, a natural gift or, or, or concerning some other thing, like service, like a generosity, now when the person is connected to the divine or has the grace of God, that particular natural gift is going to excel all the more because grace works on nature. It is not opposed to nature. So it's almost like a vessel that ultimately even somehow helps to really bring out who you truly are. You know, that's what really charism does. It really brings yes. out the best 
of human nature. Exactly. So, so grace how, or charism. How comes or, that if someone, let's say, doesn't really use that gift? Because you say charism is a gift, right? So how comes that, let's say, if someone doesn't use it, what are the implications in terms of a Christian or a human being in general? Yeah. When, the, when an individual has the charisms, um, he must find ways uh, in which he or she places this gift at the service of others. Because they are not to benefit the individual who has the grace, the gifts, or the charisms. It is to benefit others. Therefore, the individual places this charism at the service of others. Therefore, he must see where these charisms are needed, and then he or she makes sure he uses it for the good of the, the others or the society or the church. So one thing how to really develop and bring this charisma and the best out of oneself is really putting oneself in the serving of others. Do I understand this uh, correctly? So what were the most challenging moments you faced while writing the book and also the most beautiful ones? The first uh, major challenge I had is, uh, is that I left uh, Cameroon um, in the year 2013, went to Germany as a Fidei Donum priest, And three years after, in 2016, I started with these studies. Then I had to learn German, the German language from the scratch before I knew no la German language. Therefore, my most, my, my most challenging moment or my greatest challenge was the German language. Having to study in the German language, having to read books, in the German language, I having to do my research and seminars in the German language. That was the greatest challenge I faced. Yeah, having to study and do everything in the German language. At times I also had um, some little misunderstandings with my professor who was a German because I didn't quite uh, understand his orientation at the beginning. But as times went on, I began understanding the German way of research and German way of writing. And I think the, the most interesting part for me was that I was also um, reading research in German and writing in English because the, the doctorate thesis is in the English. I wrote it in English even though was studying and reading and writing my seminars or attending seminars in the German language. But that fact of writing in English language was very interesting to me because I had to do a lot of translation and a lot of interpretation in order to get it right in the mm -hmm. English language. And also, an interesting part was I had to travel a lot in order to um, this is some libraries all over Germany and out of Germany, which made it also very interesting. I, had, I got to see other countries and experience other cultures, Britain, Germany, uh, France, since I also speak um, French. So visiting the other towns also in uh, Germany, like Duisburg, Berlin, Frankfurt, That gave me also a lot of uh, experience and exposed me to uh, many more experiences. And what were the most beautiful moments while conducting your research? Yeah, the beautiful moments, um, as I said, were the aspect of visiting um, other countries, Uh, in order to visit uh, libraries, in order to make my research. So the cost of traveling to other German towns, other countries like France and Britain, 
they were interesting because I got to know lots of people, met lots of people, and discussed with them and shared ideas. Interesting moments also was were the fact that I met also other research students who were researching on the Bible and other um, subjects, which gave me um, this um, um, joy of interacting with people from other cultures. There were students from different countries also um, doing all kinds of uh, doctorate programs. And what made you research so long? I mean, you wrote about 900 pages, you know, that's huge. What made it so long? The, I think the reason why the work is uh, really voluminous is because the work is, first of all, an exegetical work interpretation of scriptures. Now with the interpretation of scriptures, it must be in-depth study, consulting lots and lots of other scholars, reading the Bible closely, consulting um, biblical dictionaries, consulting or also other theological works in order to be able to understand what the scripture is talking about. So, I also wanted the work to be simple and understood by the majority of people. And that is why I had to do my an analysis in an in-depth manner so that nothing is left untouched, nothing is left un unexplained, so that those who read the work can understand fully what the work is uh, talking about and give also the opinions of other scholars in order to either agree or to confront the idea or accept their own point of view. Yeah. And what made you decide to actually also turn your PhD thesis into a book? The first reason is that the first requirements for um, obtaining a doctorate in the German university is that you are, one's um, thesis must be published. That's the first requirement for, 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 for one to obtain and have that doctorate title. One's thesis must be published by a recognized publishing house. So that is the first reason. Then secondly, I, my professor, having gone through the book and all the second readers and other juries, um, said the work is so valuable for the, the contemporary church, and they would like the book to be in the markets for the consultation by other scholars, research scholars, and even everyone who is interested on the topic of charisms or the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That is why I decided and I saw the need to publish it because it is a valuable book which those in the future, even those in the present, will have to consult as a valuable tool for a contribution on the, on the study of charisms. How long did it take you to write your research? He's need 900 pages. I, I started in uh, March 2016, and I ended in uh, around April 2021, which means lit, uh, almost five years, exact. A little bit above five years. It took me those years because my professor was um, very, is a very critical thinker. He is um, one of the best biblical scholars in Germany and also belongs to the um, biblical commission in Rome. And so with his experience, he's about 63 years old, with his long experience in research in biblical studies, he was very critical and therefore 
um, had to be, I mean, tough, strict. That made me not to leave any stone unturned. At the beginning, I thought I would use three years to, to, to write, but uh, with his inputs, with his recommendations, with his uh, counsel, I had to take a longer time in order to make the work um, something worthwhile for the academia, for the um, academic world. Your best advice, your single most and best advice to develop charisma in yourself, but also in your life as a whole. My uh, greatest advice um, will, first of all, for, for the development and the use of charisms, will be, first of all, to discover. Each believer must take the time to discover his or her charisms. What charisms do I have? What charisms do you have? Have you discovered your charisms? And we can only discover our charisms through, first of all, prayers, and discernment, discerning the spirit. The spirit of discernment is very important to discover our charisms. And then when we have discovered our charisms, then we must be able to put these charisms into use in the life of others. Because the purpose of charisms is for the upbuilding of others, upbuilding of other believers. Therefore, we must be able to use this charism. Some charisms are ordinary charisms, while other charisms are supernatural charisms. Now, with ordinary charisms, like uh, ordinary charisms are, for example, charisms like service, gifting, um, charity, um, exaltation, the charisms of uh, faith, while supernatural charisms like speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues, uh, miracles are uh, those supernatural charisms can only be used in the context of prayers, in the context of worship, which will mean that those who have supernatural charisms must be engaged in worship, in prayers, in order to make use, to allow themselves to be used by the Holy Spirit for the benefit of others. On the other side, those who have ordinary charisms it is easy to use them because they are common in the day-to-day -day life, in and out of the church. For example, if you see somebody who needs counsel, you counsel the person, you give good advice. That is a charism. Some people have the charism of giving good advice. Or if you have the means, say you have uh, riches, you can use the riches you have in order to help the poor. Or you can be of service wherever you are serving and helping that would be ordinary charisms therefore we put those charisms in, into use to benefit others benefit believers benefit the church so our, my great advice is we just try to discover our charisms our gifts and then by the help of the holy spirit we put them into into use into practice for the benefit of others How about for non-believers? Can they also develop their charism, their ordinary charism, in one way or another? For, like I said, that charisms uh, have to do with uh, mostly, in the first place, believers, because it is um, a grace, an unmerited favor from God to believers. It, is, it has an aspect of grace, which is supernatural. Yes, it, it source is the Trinity. That is a God the Father, the God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That is the Godhead. And it is in the context of the church that St. Paul talks about charisms. Now, for unbelievers, they have what we call natural gifts. These natural gifts are given to others, to every other person who is also a believer or un unbeliever. So unbelievers have natural gifts. But for someone to have charisms, the person must be a believer. For the Because they are actually also called the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, unless someone is a believer, he will not be able to 
uh, ascend to charisms, he or she will be limited to natural gifts, which at times are similar, resemble charisms, but they lack the aspect of the supernatural. What makes you feel alive? What makes me feel alive is, first of all, the fact that um, I have faith in God. My faith in God gives me a certain kind of certainty, a certain kind of um, um, push, a certain kind of faith in life that makes me to know that um, on my own, I can do nothing. On my own, I do not exist. But in God, I live and move and have my being. And that is why I, I think I am alive because of God. God being the center of my life, who gives me life in whom I live and move and have a being. That is what actually uh, makes me feel I am alive. What's the first thing in the morning that you do when you wake up? When I, when I get up in the morning, the very first thing I do is that I make a prayer. When I leave my bed, I first of all go down on my knees, make the sign of the cross, and I thank God for the gift of a safe and sound sleep. And I thank him for making me see the new day. I thank him for the gift of life, for the gift of reservation. When I've made that prayer, then I go on now to take my bath. And then I can go now for public prayer in church. That is every morning I have um, morning prayers and then I have the Holy Mass in the church. But before I go there, I must have made my private prayer when I get up in the morning, every day of my life. And what's usually your highlight of the day? What's one thing that you look most towards to? I will actually see my, my prayer time. That is what I look most to. And it is the greatest highlight of my day, daily life. Because when I, when I, I, I go to bed, I, I pray, I go to bed. And when I get up, I know that the greatest activity I have is the, the, the morning prayers I have and then the Holy Mass I have in the morning. Yeah. At, and then in the evening also, we have um, uh, evening prayers and... Um, I think prayer is the greatest activity because I pray the, the, the liturgy of the hours in the morning and noon, evening and night. So I will say prayers. I see I cannot live without this communication, this constant communication with God. So it is always at the back of my mind. It stands very central in my life. Father Constant Leke, thank you so much for being on the show and to be truly a gift to myself and the world. Thank you very much, Mr. Yannick. I'm grateful. I appreciate it. Father Constant Leke. Fantastic. That was wonderful. That's why knowledge matters. Make your life a masterpiece. Visit now programs.d-ykm.com